Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Brian Schottlander. I'm the Audrey Geisel University Librarian here at UC San Diego. And on behalf of the UC San Diego Library and our partner, University Extension's Helen Edison Lecture Series, I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's event. It's nice to see such a full house. I want to thank my Extension colleagues, Dan Atkinson and Vice Chancellor Mary Walshock, um, for their collegiality and their partnership um, and their many efforts in putting on tonight's program. Uh, tonight, we are very fortunate indeed to have with us award-winning journalist and associate editor of the Washington Post, Bob Woodward, who joins us for his first West Coast appearance to discuss his new book, The Last of the President's Men, published in October by Simon & Schuster. Um, Bob will be available to sign the book after tonight's program, and as you will have noted as on your way in, university bookstore staff are outside the room with copies of the book for those of you who don't yet have one and would like to buy one in order to get it memorialized by Bob and his <laughs> co-conspirator, unindicted, Alex Butterfield. <laughs> unindicted. Uh, Bob's first book on Watergate, um, All the President's Men, co-authored with his fellow Post reporter Carl Bernstein, was of course a national books, uh, a national bestseller, and was followed by other books on Watergate. But the number of topics that Bob has covered over the almost 45 years he has been in the profession is truly astounding. The Iraq War, the Supreme Court, the CIA, the presidencies of Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama. And that is a partial list. I have no doubt whatsoever that he is all wor already working on his next book. And Bob, we're very honored to have you with us tonight. We were successful in bringing Bob here tonight because of one person, and that's Alex Butterfield sitting to Bob's left. It's Alex, our friend, who is the titular last of the president's men, referenced in Bob's book, <laughs> which centers on Alex's experiences and observations while deputy chief of staff in the Nixon White House. Most of what Alex shared with Bob in the last of the president's men had not been revealed in the many years following Alex's fateful testimony to the Senate Watergate Committee. Thank you, Alex. It's a fact we would not all be here tonight were it not for you. And then finally, moderating tonight's discussion between Bob and Alex will be Michael Bernstein, professor of economics, professor of history, and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost at Tulane University. An economic historian, Professor Bernstein took bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in economics from Yale. He is the author of two books, one of which, Public Purpose in, the 20th, in 20th Century America, published by Princeton, was a finalist for the Alice Hansen Jones Prize of the Economic History Association. He is the co-editor of two additional books and the associate editor of the third edition of the Dictionary of American History, the winner of the Outstanding Reference Source of the Year Award from the American Library Association. Prior to taking up his responsibilities at Tulane, Professor Bernstein served as Dean of Arts and Humanities and Professor of History here at UC San Diego where he served as one of Alex Butterfield's primary advisors. I've learned from, other, uh, from Alex's other graduate advisor, historian Michael Parrish, that the topic of Alex's dissertation, interestingly enough, is the history of presidential pardons in the 20th century. <laughs> I shall look forward to reading that book. Now, please join me in welcoming Bob Woodward, Alex Butterfield, and Michael Bernstein. Thank you very much, Brian, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, before I get into some brief introductory remarks to start the conversation, 
between our two distinguished guests. Uh, let me express sincere thanks. I know I speak for uh, Bob and Alex as well, to Brian Schottlander, the university librarian here at UCSD, Shannon Bradley, the director of public programming for UCSD television, Dolores Davies, the director of communications and engagement at UCSD, and Dan Atkinson, the Director of Public Programs for UCSD Extension. Without them, none of this would have taken place. So please join me in thanking all of them, too. Uh, I begin with the major expression of gratitude to our two guests. And I'll start uh, uh, by uh, giving thanks to uh, Bob Woodward, who is an icon to all of us who <laughs> lived through the Watergate period but even to uh, the youngsters in the room who didn't live through the Watergate period but have learned about it and know about its significance and impact in our nation, uh, thanks to Bob Woodward and, of course, to Carl Bernstein, who, no, is not a relative of mine, except to the extent that all Bernsteins are related in some way, shape, or form. Um, and, of course, great thanks to, to Alex. And I, I'd just like to say that... Um, I have always felt privileged and honored to, uh, to have been able to work with Alex as a graduate student uh, and also to count him as a friend. Uh, someone once asked me years ago, you know, what is it like to supervise the work of a graduate student who won the Distinguished Flying Cross? How do you do that? And I said, you do it very carefully. Alex has been a, a, a terrific uh, comrade through all these years. We're so fortunate to have both of these men with us tonight, and obviously to speak of the Nixon presidency, to speak of the Nixon era, to speak of Richard Nixon himself, is to call up some of the most compelling and major issues in contemporary American history and American life. To start with the obvious, the Vietnam War itself, uh, a war that cost 59,000 casualties of American servicemen and women, uh, but close to 450,000 casualties among Viet Cong and North Vietnamese regular troops, over 580,000 civilian casualties that we can account for today. Odds are it's probably a much larger number than that. Clearly one of the uh, bloodiest conflicts in our history and one that we know changed our nation. Not only was Richard Nixon the president as this conflict came to an end, he was also the president as the United States first opened up relations with the People's Republic of China. He was the president who pursued an aggressive deterrent strategy with respect to the People's Republic of China and with respect to the Soviet Union, a strategy of mutually assured destruction, which had the wonderful acronym of MAD, to frame the nuclear strategies and policies of our military. A president who fashioned the so-called Southern strategy in presidential politics to capture for the Republican Party uh, the support of conservative whites in the Southern states, obviously an issue that resonates this very moment in the primary cycle now underway as we head toward the 2016 presidential canvas. And, of course, the president who presided over one of the greatest crises in confidence with respect to the executive branch of our government in our history, a crisis that completely transformed the position of the presidency as an institution, that changed the relationship of that institution to the American electorate, and most compellingly, as I'm sure we will discuss uh, in the minutes ahead, the relationship of that institution to the media. And we're seated here on stage today, one of the architects of the transformation of that relationship. Because the Nixon presidency, for better or worse, had worked to undermine the confidence that had once emerged between reporters and our president. Bob's book, The Last of the President's Men, is a most interesting narrative about a man in Richard Nixon, about one of his chief aides, Alex Butterfield, about this transformative era in our national life. In Bob's words, reading this book, seen up close through Alex Butterfield's eyes, Nixon is both smaller and larger. And I'm also struck by the words of 
uh, a reviewer, uh, Machiko Kakutani of the New York Times, who wrote about this book, the granular details of this book slam home the mendacity, the Machiavellian scheming, and shameless lack of accountability that permeated the Nixon White House. These and many other issues we will discuss uh, in the next 50 minutes or so. Let me, let me start our conversation uh, first with you, Bob. Um, and I ask this of most authors I have the chance to talk with about their work. So you've produced this product for the, pre for the public to, uh, to read. What is it that you want your readers to take from reading this book? Well, I, I think it starts with the idea that uh, I'd done four books on Nixon, and uh, I thought I was done with him, and then started uh, talking to Alex and looking at the documents. And the, uh, the truth for me as an author is that history's never over, that you, you think you have the answers, uh, you think that you know what really happened, and then uh, you run into somebody like Butterfield who has this uh, incredible memory, has never told his story four decades later, and then uh, squirreled away 20 boxes of documents, uh, the, a good number of them uh, which had never seen the light of day. And you go through this, and you it takes you deeper into the answer, though we'll ne we're never going to get a final answer, but it takes you closer to it. Who is Richard Nixon? And you see uh, in the, the story and uh, the documents that the, there were additional deceptions on the part of Nixon that we didn't know about, and that he had this deep, unending resentment toward people who were opponents and just could not let go. And I think the, what uh, dramatized this for me the most was uh, one memo that was in Alex Files. Uh, it's called the Zilch Memo by uh, myself and lots of people. And this is early 1972, so Nixon had been in office three years, had dropped, ordered the dropping of about 2.9 million tons of bombs in Southeast Asia, North Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. And uh, the night of January 2nd, 1972, he was interviewed by Dan Rather on CBS and the bombing had intensified and Rather asked Nixon, how is it doing? And Nixon said, it's very, very effective in fact, it's so effective, I'm going to announce the withdrawal of more troops, ground troops from Vietnam. The very next day on a top secret memo uh, in his own handwriting, uh, Nixon wrote to Henry Kissinger, his national security advisor, and said, uh, the bombing that we have done has achieved zilch. It has been a failure. Let me just ask Alex, I'm sure everyone in the room is wondering. So. Uh Why'd you wait so long? Why did I wait so long? I to, was well. To reach I out like to, to think that the book could have been written uh, uh, just as well without terms like carted off and squirreled away. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's the author's right, and uh, he was the author, and I was not. This is called productive tension. <laughs> and we, answer. yeah, and, and and we actually had a very good relationship all the way through. Plus, I like your wife very much, too. <laughs> and, and she was part of the, the, yeah, of the she team. She likes uh, you a lot, and uh, I think the squirrel was a word that she gave me. <laughs> oh, then it's a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Always listen to your wife, right? Well, Alex, Alex maybe uh, you know, shift, shift back to the beginning. You, the book opens talking about you know, your, your eagerness, you know, you're transitioning from your career in the Air Force uh, and your, you know, all of your uh, uh, combat missions in Vietnam and uh, you connect with Bob Haldeman, the chief of, of uh, staff to President Nixon, and you end up 
you end up as Haldeman's deputy in the White House. So you could share your initial impressions of this man, Richard Nixon, uh, about whom Bob writes, thanks to your yeah. documents. Yeah, I, I would like to say that my initial motive was to, I had just heard in Australia, I, it was good duty, but uh, uh, not exciting, and I was coming up for eligibility for Brigadier General, and I had just heard just before the election of 68 that I was going to be extended for two more years in Australia. And uh, to me, that was, uh, th that was devastating news. And I thought, if I'm to be noticed or be uh, promoted uh, below the zone or ahead of my contemporaries, I have to either be in a very visible position in Washington or in combat. And the country was at war in Vietnam. And although I had been there earlier and flown some missions, reconnaissance missions, and actually commanded all the low and medium level reconnaissance activities there in Southeast Asia for two six month periods, uh, that was then, that was four or five years earlier and I wanted to get back in the worst way. And that was, I was gonna use, <laughs> Haldeman doesn't know it, but I was gonna try to use the, this new team of Californians coming in to the White House for my own benefit. It was a selfish thing. I didn't want anyone to know. And I wasn't going to tell Haldeman, but if I could attach myself to this incoming thing and go to work for them, perhaps in a year, and who knew how long the war would last. We assumed it would keep going for a while. I could get back to Vietnam. D just think the, of the, the, the if, smoke, if I, as you call it. Yeah, or that's your term, the smoke. O other words, the action. But just think of an alternative history. If Nixon, after elected, had said to President Lyndon Johnson, I just want one favor. There's an Air Force colonel in Australia named Butterfield. Keep him there. <laughs> 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 right. Without you, and I mean, this is what's always gravitated me to your story, is your decision to disclose the taping system, which really was Nixon's greatest secret. And uh, in the book, we go through lots of discussions about uh, how you did this and how careful you were. You wanted to make sure you told the truth, but you weren't going to be a whistleblower. And you kept telling me you're not a whistleblower. And, and uh, literally, that's true. But this is an act that cha truly changed history. Because without the Nixon tapes, he stays in office. You think that's fair? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think that's fair. Okay. Um, so, Alex, what, you, you, what, you fast but, forwarded to uh, yeah, we we but, to, you know, to Bob's brought up brought up the tape system. So, what's on your mind when you find out about the system? You're part of the team that's going to implement it. A absolutely nothing. Uh, I mean, the fact that that Nixon was going to that was going to wanted this thing tape. installed. No, I didn't uh, think much of it, and uh, I just called in the Secret Service. It was my option to bring in the military. But military guys get transferred, and the Secret Service is a little more professional in doing something confidential. So while I had my choice there, and I was the liaison with the Secret Service, so I brought them in and used the Technical Security Division, who sort of let me know right away that this was not new. They had done this before. They didn't say that in so many words, but uh, the intimation was, yes, we know how to do that, this thing never works out very well. They were sort of trying to let me know that they had had some experience with that and not good, good experience. But I said, I don't know anything about this business. I'm often given credit for being the security guy or something in the White House, knowing all about tapes. I don't know anything about tapes or taping equipment. I just conveyed the order to the head of the Technical Security Division of the Secret Service, Al Wong. I worked with him. Uh, you know, once a week for three and a half years. And he said, yes, we can do it, and we can do it in a weekend. Any weekend, the president is gone. So they put it in. I just didn't think it was, uh, you know, I didn't stop to think much about it. I had other things going on, and this is something Nixon wanted to do. It wasn't that much of a surprise to me. And it wasn't a surprise because it conformed with your other impressions of this very odd and strange personality. Yes, I, I did think that, that there's uh, 
the downside of that is if any uh, diplomats, heads of government or chiefs of state, learned about this, then that it wouldn't be good for us that our uh, they had been taped without their knowledge in our president's office. But of course, it wasn't just in the Oval Office. It was in the cabinet room. It was in the president's office across the street in the executive office building. It was upstairs in the Lincoln sitting room in the residence. It was later on put in the, his office out in uh, uh, Camp David. And uh, so it was all over the place. It was a very elaborate system. And the, uh, the unique feature was it was voice activated. In other words. Only in the Oval Office. Yeah. And, and but that that was the key, That's the right. voice activation. I mean, on the phones, it was voice activated, too. If you picked up the phone automatically, it recorded. Uh, well, that's right. That's true. And so uh, the Kennedy and Johnson had tapes, but it always required them to flip a switch and say, I want to tape this meeting. Nixon wanted a full record, yeah. which was extraordinary. And Alex, I mean, there were five microphones planted in Nixon's desk. I mean, it's, it, 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 you go to the Nixon Library and they have a little doll's house makeup, uh, mock-up of the Oval Office and they say, push this button and you push the button and the Oval Office lights up like a Christmas tree <laughs> because they had microphones yeah. in the chandeliers, they had them on... Uh, well, let me, ask, but let me ask both of you, why then, I mean, the book it gives this vivid portrayal of this incredibly resentful, anxious, paranoid, introverted man who was always worried about his power and authority and what people thought of him. Why would he do something like this? Yeah, but, but you know, you didn't see that man on the daily basis. He was calm, you know, uh, always looked the part measured everything he did. He was such a disciplined guy. You never saw him in these odd moments unless you were around all the time. And then you might see one of these eruptions. And it was, you know, some of these things that I mentioned to you, odd situations that showed the real Nixon, the fact that this was in him all the time, sort of, and he, he kept it contained because of his discipline. Uh, we, uh, you just w the White House staff did not know any of these things. Incidentally, the White House staff didn't know. Haldeman must have known them because he'd been around the man so much. But he never did uh, confide in me about them. I had to learn about them uh, for the second, third, and fourth year in the White House. The first year I wasn't quite around Nixon as often. But at the end of the first year, uh, he and I traded offices, and I was now working with the president on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, and. Uh, I saw these things. I couldn't believe some of them. But what also is interesting is how lonely Nixon was. Don't you think? I know I mean, he was lonely, yeah. yeah and you yep. would be the one to see him first uh, in the day and at the end of the day when he was in Washington. And you described for me, and this is in uh, the book, that after working in the Oval Office during the day, he most often would walk over to his EOB private office and tell what, what Nixon, I mean, here's the President of the United States, how he decides he wants to spend the evening. Yes, if the daughters were coming over, uh, he would probably go back to the residence, meaning the White House proper, and have dinner with Pat and the girls and their husbands. Or uh, Tricia wasn't married at, there at first, but Julie was married a month before the president became president. She didn't want her wedding to be in the White House, so she married David Eisenhower early. But uh, I'd say more than 50% of the time when he left the office, usually around 7, 7, 10, Haldeman scampered home around six because I think his wife demanded that of him. <laughs> uh, but seven was, was a, a, a normal leaving time. And that's when he would leave the Oval Office and with his Secret Service detail, cross West Executive Avenue into his very nice, comfortable sort of library, like a man's library, in the Executive Office building. Only with his manservant, Manola Sanchez. And he'd have a glass of wine or maybe a scotch, more often a glass of wine, yellow pad, sitting there, never took his jacket off. It says in the book he took his jacket off at 1030, but I think I said to you he went home around 1030. He always, <laughs> he always had his jacket on. 
And it just seemed odd. And that's and he had the yellow pad going or made phone calls. And had and it, Manola it, make dinner for him that, alone. Oh, that's right. And, and yes, and he he was a lonely person, but I think he relished that. I think he those mo- he liked going over there. So uh, he, this this issue of his solitude and his yeah. his withdrawal. So this is another part of the book that is so. Um, Revelatory. It's about the relationship with with Pat Nixon, with with his wife, yeah. and that you indeed were the sort of interlocutor there between the president and his yes. and his spouse. Yeah, that we, yeah, they they didn't talk. Incidentally, Bob will vouch for me here. I, I didn't. It's not fun to talk about that. I liked the president. I liked him a lot. You know, once he got to like me. I reciprocated. I I liked the hell out of him. If he, he was going to like me. And then he put me on to the, I had the Pat Duty, which as Haldeman says in the book, and he had tried and he didn't last very long because he always took the president's position and didn't seem to show much understanding with Pat. And later Dwight Chapin was given that duty and he lasted less than less time than, than Haldeman. Well, I was the new guy, so they thought maybe, you know, she, I, I won't be that affected by taking the president's position. And I did enjoy working with her. She's a wonderful person and very down to earth. And I met with her at least twice a week, usually for about an hour, hour and a half, over in her little living room outside of her bedroom. And uh, it was she had a a lonely life. Tell the story when you're on the helicopter with them going up uh, and uh, she proposes that they... She, uh, go, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, she, Pat Nixon, yeah. said uh, to Dick, Dick, let's go spend uh, some of the Christmas holidays in New York City. Yeah, that's right. And on the chopper, uh, my position was sitting right across from them. They're sitting facing each other in nice, big, comfortable seats. And either Haldeman or I sat right across the aisle, so close to him. The doctor and the Secret Service and the military aides are in the back part of the, of the helicopter. And she said just that, oh, Dick, let's go up to New York. We bring the girls. It's Christmas, chestnuts roasting on the (laughs) corner and all of that sort of thing. And we could have some fun and you could relax. And he's writing in the yellow pad and he didn't answer her. And, you know, one wants to say, answer her, God damn it. I mean, that's the way I felt. That's the way I felt. But, you know, you don't say that, but that's what I was thinking. And, and she and went on a couple of times. Well, yeah. Said, "Yeah, let's let's we'll go see a play. Uh, yeah. New York is fun." At and Christmas he never did. Time. He never 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 deviated. even looked up. No, never looked up. And that that's hurtful. And she had to be embarrassed. She knew that I was witnessing this sort of thing. And so Painful. those things hurt. Yeah. Painful. So this again, all of this part of a portrait that the book that the book sort of completes in a way. I mean. Yeah. Obviously, there's been an enormous amount written about Richard Nixon, but in, in, a, in certain very intimate ways, this book acquaints us with this, you know, very strange and odd man whom you served for several years, uh, who, you know, uh, as we noted at the start of our conversation, I mean, he played a crucial role in political change in our country. I mean, even independent of the Watergate crisis, just thinking of Vietnam, China, you know, and... Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of domestic policy initiatives he led. Mm-hmm. You know, what does that say to us about our images of you know our presidents as leaders and as change agents, and then as individuals, we hardly know at all. Yeah. Well, Bob has a theory on that, and I guess <laughs> you're right about the way you feel. We don't. It's almost impossible, I think, to vet our presidents much more than we do. And Bob does say that that's the job of the press to do that. Would we have elected Richard Nixon if we had known that he was so petty? Not and that so that haunted and about enemies, real or perceived. That's right. That, that was the, the difficulty. And I'm sorry, you didn't want me to finish about the Zilch memo, but I'm <laughs> going to if that's okay. <laughs> Right because if, if it really is important, uh, uh, I was in the uh, Navy during the Vietnam War, and there is an unspoken, unsigned contract between everyone in the military and the commander in chief, and that is you do your job. I was on a ship off the coast of Vietnam, and the commander in chief's going to do his job. 
And in this memo, you find Nixon saying that they dropped all the, this tonnage of bombs, killed hundreds of thousands of people, and uh, in his assessment, achieved zilch, and it was a failure. And uh, if you connect all the dots with the tapes and other documents, you discover that Nixon was fighting this war in 72 and dropping all of these bombs because it was popular. And he's there with Kissinger. He says, oh, look at the latest poll. Yeah. Everyone loves the bombs that we're dropping, mm -hmm. two to one, two and a half to one. And at the moment, which is uh, May 8, 1972, when Nixon orders the mining of Haiphong and the most intensive bombing of the North, Kissinger literally says to the president that it was on May 8 that you won election. Not the war, but election. And if there is a corruption that is almost unforgivable, I'm sorry, is unforgivable. It is for the commander in chief to conduct a war with his political interest in mind. Now there's always- For the popularity an, poll. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's always an element of that. Of course. But in this case, in his own language, and we now look at the Vietnam War bombing studies, and Nixon was right. He realized it wasn't working. And he continued it in the year 70, 1972, dropping 1.1 million to additional wow. tons of bombs. And uh, for me, it's the other side of Watergate. Watergate was we're going to spy and sabotage and break the law to ensure that the Democrats nominate the weakest candidate so Nixon can be reelected. And the other side is we're going to continue the war in this very aggressive way because it's popular and it will help Richard Nixon win reelection. And but, uh, but let me say there, he yeah. knew he was going to win reelection. We knew we were going to win reelection. But not he wanted to break a record. Yes, but, but, but that is not until near the end of 72. In the beginning of 72, as the record and the uh, tapes show, uh, Nixon was deeply worried that the Democrats were going to nominate Senator Muskie, who was opposed mm -hmm. to the war, mm -hmm. who would have been the strongest candidate. And so they declared this war of sabotage and spying largely on Muskie and other Democrats, and so they weren't sure they were going to win. At the end, yes, the polls mm -hmm. and the fact that McGovern was, but, uh, you know, and, and this adds to, and this is why I thank you, if I may, for having the guts to tell the story of what happened, what you observed, to share the documents, because it takes us to that question, who was Richard Nixon? And we know a lot more because of that. And uh, I, I think deeply about we're going to elect a new president next year who's going to have lots of troubles. And we better, uh, a lot of trouble to deal with. And we better know who that person is. And we better not be surprised. And this book and your story is about Nixon, but it's larger. I think it's, it's a warning. About in us. a certain way, about, about we presidency. better, and this is the job of the press, find out about who these people are in depth so we are not surprised again. So Alex, let's, uh, you know, uh, as Bob says, you know, you've, you made several, you took several courageous steps, uh, both recently and decades ago to ensure that uh, the American people would know a great deal more about Richard Nixon and what happened in the Nixon White House. So let's talk about the tapes and, you know, fateful decisions made about knowledge about those tapes. Um, when the Watergate break-ins occurred, and then, of course, as the, you know, as the press, <laughs> Uh, led by distinguished company right up here on this stage, started to pose more and more questions about what happened in the Watergate mm -hmm, comments. Mm -hmm. Were you thinking about the tapes? You know, Were you anticipating that this might well, you know, well, suddenly mushroom have... into a huge Oh, yes, of course issue? I was, yeah. I was thinking about the tapes when I was in the Oval Office 
and uh, Richard Nixon was talking. He seemed, he spoke as though he were completely oblivious to the fact that those tapes are running. There. I, I wanted to say a couple of times, we better run that back. I mean, you really... <laughs> uh, but he, he had faith in our system. Very few people knew. His longtime faithful secretary, Rosemary Woods, didn't have a clue ever. We kept that secret for over two years. And Kissinger didn't Kissinger know. Kissinger didn't know. Ehrlichman didn't know. And Ehrlichman would normally know everything Haldeman knew. Uh, only, only the president, Bob Haldeman, and his uh, staff assistant, Larry Higby, and I knew. And then Al Wong, the boss who put them in, and From four technicians. Service. I used to think it was three, but they're four technicians. So that's five Secret Service guys and four other people. Did you, did you, and, did you and Bob Haldeman talk about, you know, gee, this thing, this no. could blow up if these tapes no. you know, are revealed? No, the, the, we were pretty confident that if, as long as we kept the secret, it would be kept, and that, that is the way it was. Then I wanted to leave the White House. Wonderful job that I had. And, you know, I forgot the Vietnam thing. I was a victim. I was ensnared by the glitter of the presidency myself just from that little 40-minute talk with Haldeman at the Pierre Hotel in, in New York. I thought, uh, and then when he offered me that job on January 12th, eight days before the inaugural, to be his deputy, I had worked a little bit in the Johnson White House with McNamara. Every time the Secretary of Defense went, I went with him, and I... I knew what the White House was all about, and I thought, Deputy White House Chief of Staff, that is not too bad. I will think about that. <laughs> and so that's why I decided to uh, get out of the Air Force immediately and uh, join the Nixon team. Get but, out. But, yeah, can, can I just in yeah. interrupt and, and ask this question? Because what's so interesting, the presumption Nixon had and he wrote this in his memoirs that he thought the taping system would never be disclosed, that no one would ever learn about it. And what that tells us, uh, not just about the Nixon White House, but I think about the White House in general, that there's that sense of invincibility oh, there is. There that is. we have all the power now. We have all the cards and no one can challenge us. And, and that for good reason. That was the norm. If yes. People tried and I, and I, I think a lot of people would argue to a certain extent that's the norm today, that there are a lot of people in the, who think and there's some evidence and I've done two books on Obama, that they have a sort of immunity, that they, uh, my God, we are the president, mm -hmm. and we, make, we have all this power and make all of these decisions. And, and of course, it was the Watergate crisis itself that changed that relationship between the press and the president. Nowadays, I mean, there's much more of an adversarial relationship than existed prior to, prior to the Watergate. Yeah, that's, well, that's one of the legacies, yeah, that, that the executive branch lost power and the legislative branch and the media gained but, from Watergate. But yeah, now, let, uh, let's look at the year 2015 and, and there, it, the message managers, the press people, the communications people in the White House and in Congress and in lots of institutions in this country have immense power. And you call the White House, a young reporter told me this recently, said he called the White House and wanted to talk to somebody about a story, which was actually a good idea. And the press officer said, why is that a story? And it's kind of like, uh, you know, we're going to decide over here what's the story. We're going to answer what we want. And there, uh, I found in working on books about... Uh, George W. Bush and Obama, that if you had a year, you could get information, you could talk to people, you could interview the president. But if you have to do it on deadline or you have to do it in a week, they can stonewall you. Well, and, but think, but, but Bob, and they you know, do. You've, 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 I know you've read some of the oral histories with you know, journalists who covered 
uh, the Roosevelt White House and the Great Depression and World War II. And, you know, now, of course, we know that the president had a mistress. You know, the president was manipulating a lot of outcomes. Uh, the president drank alcohol at a prodigious rate all day long. None of that was known at the time. And these journalists have been asked in these articles, well, why didn't you tell anybody? Why, why didn't you write about this? And they would say, because we were told that if we said these things, we'd never be allowed back into the White House ever again. Well, there's That's some of the that, but now. there's also that a lot of people didn't know and that the, this uh, information didn't circulate. Was, and uh, uh, I, I think there, I think we ought to uh, face reality uh, in the press and the public and voters that we do not know enough about what goes on in the White House or the Congress, the CIA, the Pentagon, you name it. And part of it is uh, a closed system has been created by lots of people in high places to make sure they control the message. And it, when you are living in an environment of impatience and speed in the internet, and people think a story is a 140 character tweet. It isn't. And, uh, you know, those tweets are fine, but they don't really get to what's going on. And you've got to peel the onion, and that takes time. And people in the press rarely have sufficient time to dig. To do that. Speaking Go ahead. of those tapes that you wanted to get back to, um, a lot of people don't know, I don't think, that I would have been scot-free had you not fingered me. You <laughs> fingered me. It was Bob who was interviewed early on by w when the Watergate committee started, opened up around May of 73, and they published in the Washington Post all the people they were going to interrogate throughout the summer of 73 in the order in which they would interrogate them. Uh, Senator Irwin interviewed Bob because he was a star investigative reporter and said, do you want to join our committee staff over here? And Bob said, no, I'm happy at the Post. And he said, well, do you know any smart young person that might want to do that? And he said, yes, I do indeed. And he mentioned his friend that I guess they were both from Wheaton, Illinois, knew each other as young men, Scott Armstrong, who was the co-author of The Brethren, Bob's third book. But that hadn't happened yet, I guess. That hadn't it. happened yet. So, and then Scott then... So uh, Scott gets the job. Now he's got an avenue to the committee, and his man is Scott there. Yeah. So, and, and so there, after John Dean testifies and makes the accusations... Which was June of 73. Uh, ...against the president, uh, saying the president was running the cover-up, uh, the Senate Watergate Committee said, how are we going to uh, confirm this or refuted yeah, yeah. and yeah, so they what, what, scott what, armstrong asked me who they should talk to because they're looking for satellite witnesses and i said the one guy i never talked to is a guy named alexander butterfield and i went to his house one night and knocked on the door and no one was there and i failed to follow up and so then they called you that friday afternoon right. in july and went you know, for hours asking you questions, and it wasn't Scott, but it was the former FBI well, agent, right. Don Sanders, who asked you the question. Remember the question? So, of course, I remember the, the question, but th there, there was then this, you could call it a dilemma, and to, to keep it from being a dilemma, the dilemma being, am I going to be true to my word to the president that I would never tell about the tapes? Haldeman and I were sworn to secrecy? Or was I going to tell about the tapes? I, I, there, I was a little conflicted there momentarily, and I thought, I will just not say anything about it unless I'm asked a direct question. And it had to You would think be, he's a lawyer, <laughs> but he's not. <laughs> no, not at all. And uh, so, did you, so, did, that, so that's what I did. That was my plan. And, and was it your uh, expectation before that phone call uh, uh, to come meet initially with the staff of the committee? You thought, well, I'll probably oh. never get that direct question. Oh, you yes. I, I, had, no, I was sure I would not get a question. And you on thought the tape. you wouldn't even be called. 
And I think it's possible. I I don't know that they would not have got to you because you were uh, an unknown figure. No, and I was leaving Tuesday on a almost a three week trip. I was going to be in another country, and uh, I was just looking forward to Tuesday morning when I was going to leave. And I was vetted by this staff group on Friday, the the thirteenth of of uh, of (laughs) July of seventy three. And I held them off uh, uh, for more than four hours. And finally, when Scott Armstrong turned it over to the minority, that's uh, Fred Thompson's assistant, uh, not Fred Thompson, but his assistant in there, a former FBI guy, uh, he said, getting back to that memo, Mr. Butterfield, and they had asked me about the memo. They said, where might this have come from? If I had wanted to tell them blow everything, I could have considered that a direct question. Where might this have come from? I could say, I know where this came from. This could only have come from one place. It was a very detailed memo, P and D for president and dean. And it looked just exactly like a transcript from the tapes. I thought, how the hell could they get this? But I said... And what's interesting, the White House... Fred Bizarre, the lawyer, sent it down to the Watergate I, I, committee. That's why I couldn't believe what I was reading. <laughs> so I said, to fuzz it a little bit, I said, that looks too detailed for memory. I just don't know. And I threw it down on the table. I said, let me think about that for a moment. And to my great surprise and relief, they went on with other things, administrative things, until it got to the minority guy, Don Sanders, the former FBI guy who came back and said, Mr. Butterfield, getting back to that memo. You mentioned a dicta, a dicta belt machine the president used, but it was only for Rose Woods. These are his exact, was there ever any other uh, listening device or recording thing in the Oval Office? That was about as direct as you could get, so I thought, and so what, I was toast. I, I really thought I would be out the next day. So you, you, you the, the fateful question comes and you answer it, and what are you thinking at that point when you say, yes, there, there was? Well, I'm equipment. thinking of, yeah, I just didn't think I'd be around uh, uh, long. But I, I, I knew that going in if I had to do that. On the other hand, I had befriended the guy that used to run Meet the Press, uh, Larry Spivak. Yeah. And he said, no, no, you're the last guy. They won't fire you right after. It would look too funny, you know, if you tell about the tapes. You're going to be around for a while. So. But, he, but <laughs> here's an interesting uh, footnote that is not in the book, which you know about. When you disclosed the taping system that Friday, July 13th, 1973, it was secret among the staff, but there were particularly Sam Dash, who was the chief counsel, he was, they told him about it. Yeah. And I talked to Dash that day, and he said, you won't believe what happened. Nixon taped himself. And I checked with other people, and indeed, that's what you testified to. And so I was haunted. I mean, there are these the secret tapes. What, what am I going to do? What should we do? And so... On Saturday, I was kind of, you know, figuring, you know, should I talk to somebody at the Post? So on Saturday night, I called Ben Bradley, who was the editor. Carl and I never used the chain of command, by the way. We always went right to him. And I said, uh, Nixon taped himself. There's a secret taping system. And Nixon said, and, and Bradley said, what? What did Nixon do? They had a secret taping system. And... Uh, he didn't seem impressed, and I said, well, what do you think? And Ben said, well, I wouldn't bust one on it, and I think it's just kind of a B-plus story. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm off the hook, and I took Sunday off, and then they called you on Monday to testify in public, and there was one of those uproars in the newsroom in Washington, secret tapes. And so to Bradley's credit, he came by at my desk and he knocked and he said, okay, it's better than a B plus. <laughs> <laughs> Up to, to an A minus, uh, I a think. Minus. Yeah. So Alex, what happened on the Monday? Yeah. You know, you have your moment before the, the national cameras, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, minority counsel to the committee, Fred Thompson, who uh, indeed uh, yeah, that's a, courtesy, a few weeks ago uh, asked you that question. Um, what happened right after that? What happened later that day? 
later that day. Uh, you know, you, I, you, now I, you've gone vividly public on Well, first this. of all, he did say he must have bought a field with a Tennessee accent. He was a Baker uh, person that Baker had brought in there to be on the committee. Right. Uh, he said, are you aware of listening devices in the Oval Office? That was the opening question. And uh, I... That was, he used the present tense. And I'd been gone from the White House for four months. I'd been at the FAA. I was the new FAA administrator. And I paused for a long time, and I thought, well, we might as well get this straight. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. Are you aware of any devices that were installed in the executive office building office of the president? Yes, sir, at that time. Were they installed at the same time? They were installed at the same time. Could you tell us a little bit about how those devices worked, uh, how they were activated, for example? I don't have the technical knowledge, but I will tell you what I know about how those devices were triggered. Uh, they were installed, of course, for historical purposes to record the President's business, and they were installed in his two offices, the Oval Office and the EOB office. And then from then on, they asked a lot of questions. And you know, I was only on there for about an hour 20 or something like that. Most people on there were for days. I had Kambach sitting behind me. They had injected me. It was me. President's personal lawyer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and he was waiting to go on. He had no idea why I was put in ahead of him. And, and uh, so then I walked down the hall. I didn't know there was nobody around. I, I didn't know how the hell to get out of that building. I had no idea how to get out of that building. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I called my driver and he said, I'm circling out here and I, but I can't find the exit. So, but I finally <laughs> did. And this is a funny, this is a funny story. Everybody, your, the official cars were all Mercury's, the big Mercury. And uh, they had stopped using Chryslers and Cadillacs. And he said he'd been circling out there. So I came out some door. I don't know where. And I see it. There's a lot of traffic out there. But I see the Mercury out there. So I make a run for it. And there are reporters out there. And they're running after me. And I'm running a little faster. I'm a little closer to the car. And I jump in the back seat. It isn't even my car. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> It's just some guy with a mercury and his back <laughs> and his back door was open. But he he picked up on it right. He saw all these people running and he you know, like get right. in, you know. I'm, <laughs> where are we going? Then suddenly he's the driver, you know, on the getaway car. But he was pretty nice. He circled around and, and uh you know, we found my driver. These two Mercury's came alongside and I jumped from one to the other. But no, I never saw a paper. I went back. I was leaving the next morning, 6 o'clock takeoff for the Soviet Union. And I had a lot of stuff to do. So I didn't see any news. And uh, then the, ne the next faced, day. You faced some acrimony subsequently from some of your oh. former colleagues and oh. in the White House oh, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, I did. That hurt. And as I told Bob, it hurt more with the Air Force guys. Uh, the commander in chief is the commander in chief. And it's kind of a military thing. And. It appeared that I had done harm to the president by some people. And like, who, who is that upstart son of a bitch? I know that's, that was the, <clears throat> and I had, you I, I had friends that was, didn't speak to me. You uh, should have again. said, Ben Bradley thinks it's only a B plus. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that was hard. A lot of people didn't understand. Some people at the White House didn't understand. And by understand, I mean, well, also, understand the fact that this man they loved, and I have never seen, they, there were a lot of, uh, they deified him, a lot of the people on that staff. I hadn't seen that before. I had admired and always had admired a lot of people, men and women. But this awe, I, I had never been quite in awe of some of the way they were all in awe of Richard Nixon and his but, brilliance and all of that. But, you, but so, Nixon assigned you tasks. Yeah. that uh, took away some of that awe. And uh, one of the ones that really struck me when you told me about it, and then their memos to back it up, is he was walking in the staff offices Christmas Eve 1969, the first year uh, of his presidency, and saw 
a lot of the staff people, or a good number of them, had pictures of John F. Kennedy on their desks or on the, the mm -hmm. wall. Yeah, and not then Nixon, technically not staff people. Or their civil support, servants. Uh, supports, mm, support support people. staff. The people who are in the White House all the time. Presidents come and go. The central files people, the telegraph office people, the travel office. Those people are there at the White House all the time. So they worked for a lot of presidents, and many of them had maybe their favorite president. On. Yeah, and then Nixon uh, didn't like it blew up and said to you, this is an infestation. I want you to investigate. <laughs> there was one woman who had two John F. Kennedy oh, pictures. Yeah. A, a, get her, a, he said. A, a double infestation. And get all those pictures out and get president uh, pictures of, of Nixon in their place and you conducted this big investigation and you I mean this is what stunned me you wrote a memo not to Haldeman though Haldeman at one point said to you you know you got to get on with this investigation because Nixon brings it up asks about it. about it every week at least yeah but it started with Nixon and me Haldeman got into it later yeah. right and, so. and, and and you write the memo to Nixon uh, describing how you got all the infestation out and uh, got his pictures up. But uh, the, the heading on the memo is sanitization of the... Uh, I mean, uh, I, 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 when I read that, I thought, sanitization that somehow, uh, you know, the president has convinced you that somehow this is so bad that they have to go sanitize the place to get John F. Kennedy mm -hmm. pictures out? Mm -hmm. What Amazing did you story. think? You know, unfortunately, we were, we're just about out of time. We could go on for a long time. We have an opportunity to continue the discussion in another context in just a moment. But let me just say a few words before we get to our, to our question and answer period. Um, first of all, I want to thank Bob Woodward. I know all of you would agree with me to thank Bob for his courage uh, his commitment to a free press, uh, his determination to write contemporary history, and of course the central role he played in what had fast become one of the great crises in our, in our nation's history. And I also, of course, and I know you all join me, I want to thank Alex Butterfield for his courage, his wisdom. You know, I, I have to say, Alex, and I wanted to, to conclude with this remark, I mean, amidst all the the gray areas and moral dilemmas amidst all the claims and counterclaims that we know have been made in the past, are made, and with this book now, you know, will continue to be made. Um, I have to say, with that one simple declarative answer to a straightforward question before the Watergate Committee, you saved American democracy, Alex. I really believe that. Thank you both. You mean I, you don't think I'm going to have to wear this? <laughs> <laughs> wow.